in Blantyre in 1813, David Livingstone was sent to work in the local mill when only 10 years old. Despite long hours of toil, he pursued an education and eventually saved enough money to enter Anderson's College in Glasgow as a medical student. His move to the urban centre brought him into contact with some of the foremost scientific minds of the day and grounded him in the skills of analytical observation that would so clearly mark his later writings. While at the Andersonian, he attended courses in anatomy, surgery and materia medica while finding time to study Greek at the University of Glasgow and also attend lectures on divinity. Livingston went on to join the London Missionary Society and was soon enticed to South Africa by his future father-in-law, Robert Moffat, who so vividly described the smoke of a thousand villages where no missionary had yet visited. After 11 years of mission work, Livingston's famous explorations began in earnest. In collaboration with Sekeletu, the chief of the Kololo, he determined to open a trade route from the interior to the African coast. In an astonishing journey that led him from east to west, he crossed the entire continent. On returning to Britain, Livingston was astonished to find that he had become a national hero. In recognition of his achievements, he was presented with the prestigious gold medal of the Royal Geographical Society and awarded an honorary degree at the University of Glasgow. Livingstone returned to Africa in 1858, this time to evaluate the potential for British trade on the Zambezi. He hoped, through Christianity and legitimate commerce, to undermine the slave trade. As he put it in his speech in Glasgow, The object we have ultimately in view is not merely exploration, not merely to be able to say that we have gone through such a latitude and to such a longitude and we have found such and such wonders there. That is not the chief object we have in view. Our object is a much higher one. It cannot be the design of providence that the horrid system of slavery should exist forever or that we should be supporters of that system. And yet we are, though unwillingly, the chief supporters of slavery. Now, let's mercantile men, ministers and all work together so as to eventually eradicate that foul blot from the European name. The expedition fell into difficulties and was eventually recalled to England. Yet Livingston had no thoughts of remaining in Britain and he was soon back in Africa, this time hoping to settle the age-old question of the source of the Nile. His last journey took him through vast regions of East and Central Africa, including Mozambique, Tanzania, Malawi, Zambia and the Democratic Republic of Congo. It was during this time that he was relieved by Henry Morton Stanley, the young reporter from the New York Herald, who greeted him with the now famous line, Dr. Livingston, I presume? Eventually, Livingston was defeated by sickness and he passed away in May 1873 in the village of Chitambo. But his death had a powerful effect on Victorian Britain and inspired numerous overseas missions. His name was taken up by later imperialists who saw him as a patron saint of the British Empire. Yet, if Livingston was used in the name of the Empire, he continues to be remembered with affection in parts of Africa. If you go to Malawi today, you'll find uh, this beautiful city called Blanta, named after Dr. David Livingston. So David Livingston has left uh, a mark uh, on Malawi, and uh, people remember him so fondly. So Dr. David Livingston has uh, left a legacy in Malawi which will never be erased. For the former Zambian president, Kenneth Kaunda, Livingston was less an imperialist than the first freedom fighter for Africans. It is of real significance that place names associated with him in Malawi and Zambia have not been changed following independence. Livingston's legacy continues to live on at the University of Glasgow. He was a trained medical practitioner 
an astute commentator on health and disease in Africa, and an important figure in the development of tropical medicine. Today, the university follows in his footsteps by striving to understand and treat diseases that affect some of the world's poorest people. He made the most astonishing notes about a variety of diseases, diseases like elephantiasis, uh, where parasitic worms cause a grotesque swelling of the skin. Uh, he noted many villages had um, high incidence of geophagy, where people eat soil, and he realized that they were eating soil to try to replenish nutrients which were being taken away by helminth worm infections inside people. So the disease that I've been principally interested in is human African trypanosomiasis. It's a disease caused by the tiny single-celled parasites called trypanosomes, which are transmitted by tsetse flies. And Livingstone himself was probably the first person to make it widely known that the tsetse fly was responsible for transmitting some sort of toxin, which was responsible for animals not being able to survive in Africa. Scotland today, and the University of Glasgow in particular, still has more people, a higher concentration of people working in tropical diseases than anywhere else in the world. And I think it is possible to trace that back to the legacy of Dr. David Livingstone. My area of research expertise is really the, on the ecology of these mosquitoes that transmit malaria. Um, and our philosophy is really that you have to know your enemy if you want to, to successfully beat it. And we look at across uh, Africa at the strategies that are most successful in controlling malaria. They are generally those that are targeted at stopping that mosquito from finding people and biting them. What my work is, is doing is really starting from, from those kinds of insights to look at all other aspects of the mosquito's ecology and the behaviour, how it finds people, where it lives in the environment, how it finds mates, what are the sort of environmental resources that it really needs to survive, and trying to, to figure out whether we can use that knowledge to design cleverer ways to intervene and stop that transmission cycle. When Livingston was working in Africa, um, his sort of primary goal was to abolish slavery worldwide. Uh, and, and I like to think that he would see the chronic diseases such as malaria as another real form of slavery. And he made several insights that helped others at the time um, be able to cope with malaria and, and look for cures to it, including sort of revamping the, this old traditional remedy of, of quinine bark as a possible cure, which he took himself and was later widely distributed as a sort of anti-malarial drug. And to this day, we still use quinine for some forms of, of treatment in Africa. For both good and ill, Livingston heightened European interest in the African continent. He was motivated by the burning desire to improve the conditions of the people he encountered there. Today, the University of Glasgow works in partnership with African universities, scholars and students in order to address the challenges in health, education and development that Africa faces in the 21st century. So an absolutely crucial part of all the work that we do in collaboration with, with uh, research institutes and scientists in uh, malaria endemic settings in Africa is training the way that we feel will be the future of successful disease control is that any research activities must be done fundamentally in partnership with those who are experiencing the bulk of the disease in sub-Saharan Africa. So the, the approach that we have is trying to move away from the paradigm of having this disease only studied by a few people in the West who aren't really intimately affected by it to have these outstanding, highly motivated, extremely dedicated young scientists from Africa conduct really high level um, training in, th in this disease and use that knowledge to go back and, and, and maintain and control disease surveillance programs in their home country. Um, that is the future if we're really going to get on top of this disease. At the University of, uh, of Glasgow, um, we have a, a centre, Glasgow Centre for International Development, that has the acronym of GSID. And one element of GSID's work uh, has been very much involved in what we call capacity strengthening. That's building that research capacity of, uh, of, of science uh, and other uh, research areas as well for that matter. Uh, in our partner universities in Africa, we have a number of partner universities. Uh, and to fund these we've had what are called GSID uh, scholarships. And it's a fund that we want obviously to, uh, to, to expand because the GC scholars that we've had through so far um, have all been engaged in researching in uh, topics that have direct development relevance uh, to, their, to their home country. And that's important 
because I think it's important that people uh, are trained in research areas that do have that relevance, that when they do return to country, they're able to continue that kind of research uh, afterwards. So the GC scholarship scheme then is designed to help students from some of the poorest of, uh, of African countries uh, to, to come here and work in partnership with ourselves here uh, and, as I said, with our partners in Africa as well. The intellectual and cultural traditions of Glasgow shaped Livingstone profoundly. It was here that he made friends who would remain lifelong supporters. When he received his honorary degree, he looked back on his student days in Glasgow with affection. In speaking to the young men before me, I remember well when I was among you. And now that I've got on pretty far in life, looking back, I remember my college days in Glasgow with great delight. In this, were it possible, I should like to begin over again. If I were to do so, there are a good many things I would avoid and many things I would follow more closely. But I look back to my companions. I see that every one of them who has become a real Christian man, a real bold Christian man, and has set himself to one thing with energy and perseverance, has come to something. It affords me, gentlemen, great pleasure indeed to come among you, because I look upon you, young men who are preparing to occupy most important situations in this country, as the agents that will, in all probability, ensure the ultimate success to the great object that I have in view.